Okay, good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming to the now 11th annual Fretboard Journal Vintage Instrument Workshop and Tasting. We've had a lot of, uh, in the last 11 years, a lot of great players that have um, agreed to do this with us, and it's really, we appreciate them coming to do this. Those of you who try to play like I do, it's hard to get used to that, the neck size and the nut and the string spacing differences and all that stuff to get it right. And here we're asking these guys to do it about 20 different times on different size and styles, so we appreciate them coming. If I make um, mistakes, it's the instrument's fault. Yeah. <laughs> two, two really great artists today, both Grammy nominated, uh, one of the best songwriters, singer-songwriters that we have in our genre, and a couple magazines have called um, this other guy the best mandolin player around. So uh, Daryl Scott and Matt Flynn are here with us today. <laughs> And we really appreciate them coming. Um, we're going to start these off in somewhat chronological order, and then after a while we'll just get lost in some of the nice old instruments. So we're starting off with a, John Ashbourne made guitars in the Pennsylvania area in the mid-1800s. The one that Daryl's holding was 1848. Um, he was making way more guitars than C.F. Martin was in those days. Some really innovative things in the Industrial Revolution starting. And, you know, in those days, of course, there were not recordings, there were no radio. If you wanted music at home, you had to learn to play it. And if you wanted the song that you really loved, you had to go buy the sheet music and learn to read it and learn to play it. So that's where the roots of our music really came from. And they were pretty small guitars. Some people call them parlor guitars because they're small and they play them in the parlor because you couldn't really hear volume-wise a lot of what was going on. Uh, but he had some great innovations. He built his guitar factory, Mr. Ashbourne did, on uh, next to a river. So he had a water wheel and powered by water power and had some machine tools that really started in that very early time. Uh, the one that Matt's holding is an Aubrey Marie. It's a French guitar made in the exact same time period. Uh, very fancy inlay. And, you know, as people came over from Europe to settle here in the... United States, um, they brought their heritage and many of their instruments with them. So that kind of, in, both of these really inspired and uh, with Martin and Gibson and stuff, they used some of these ideas that were really innovative at the time. Uh, the company that sold Ashbourne's guitars was called Firth and Pond. It was uh, really, it, we'll see in a little bit, in the turn of the century, there was a company called Lion and Healy out of Chicago, and they were probably the largest musical instrument and accessory dealer in the world and their predecessor was this Firth and Pond. They also published music, and the very first, um, one of Stephen Foster's first songs published in 1854 by the same Firth and Pond was uh, Hard Times Come Again No More. So we thought, we asked these guys, we're not gonna, they're gonna pick what song they make, but uh, other songs, but we asked them to play. If you were playing in 1854 and just went out and bought Stephen Foster's new hit, you would have been playing on one of these two guitars and hard times come again no more. So a little trip back in history to 1854, and we thank Stephen Foster for all the 200 and some songs he wrote for us, and we'll let you guys have it. <laughs> Let us pause in life's pleasures and count its many tears while we all sup sorrow with the poor. There's a song that will linger forever in our ears. Oh, hard times come again. Is a song, a sigh of the weary. Oh, hard times, hard times come again no more. Many days. 
days you have lingered around my cabin door. Oh, hard times come again no Might as well end it right there. I don't know if it can get any better than that, you guys. Thanks. It, it won't. It won't. <laughs> um, I, there's a lot of people, you know, this, this is a labor of love for us that do this workshop, but um, it takes an awful lot of people to let this come together. First of all, we need to thank the Fretboard Journal for, and David Grisman for giving us the inspiration for this, for his historic tone poems album where he got a bunch of instruments together with he and Tony and did the recording. Um, the Dario sends us new strings every year for all of these, so thanks to them. The strings we're using are kind of displayed up here in case you have a curiosity and come talk about it later as well. Um, a number of people bring instruments to this to make the workshop all come together, so we really appreciate all them. Um, Jim Brown with Jet City Guitar, Bill with Rosewood Guitar, a number of Perry, um, Phil, a lot of Chuck, a lot of folks bring their guitars to it. You guys get to hear them today, and it's great. And we got some special ones and some more to follow up with. And we got Phil Williams, uh, F5 Lore here today, too. We'll have a little more talk about that. Um, now, moving up in time to just around the, before the turn of the century, we have a Martin 218 from 1870 and a single 028 from 1985. Now, the, in the Martin series, most of you know um, the 18 significant. Uh, signifies mahogany sides and back, and the 28 style was rosewood sides and back, and of course all Brazilian in those days. So but guitars started to get a little bit bigger than the smaller parlor stars, uh, parlor guitars in that time period. So we're gonna hear a 1870 218 and a single 028 from 1885. 
and we'll get to the Mandels for you soon, Matt. <laughs> train are coming, it's rolling round a bit, and I ain't seen the sunshine since I don't know when, and I'm stuck in Folsom prison, time is dragging on, and that train keeps a rolling on down to San Antonio. thing I noticed, this may have nothing to do with anything, the guitars got louder from 1840-something to 1870. Maybe it's just those two guitars. Did you notice anything like that? Yeah, well, just I was playing speaking. a steel string this time. You, was this still nylon? That Mine was still yeah, nylon, but it, but it so was compared to my other nylon, it kind of cut through. Did, did it sound like that out there? Okay, gotcha. So yeah, they really, pitch. they were still mostly nylon before turn of the century. I think Martin was really into the 20s before they were designed for steel strings. Now, the one, we're moving up to 1909. The one you're holding was, um, it's been here before, but it's kind of a historically significant one. It was really the first catalog steel string big body guitar. It was uh, Line and Healy, again, was the largest musical instrument distributor in that time. And they had a smaller parlor size that was called the Lakeside Guitar and they made this one called the Lakeside Jumbo. Um, so most pe some people call it the first dreadnought. Now it's not really the same as a dread. You can see it's round-shouldered and it's really deep, deeper than most dreadnoughts. But you know, at the turn of the century, hugely popular were the mandolin orchestras. And every city had one. Um, really, really, uh, um, all of the old Gibson A's and uh, um, some of the Styled five um, with a tater bug or you know bullback type mandolins that I'm not going to ma make Matt play this one, but this was Martin's top of the line style five. It's like their D45 version of the the mandolin in those days. But then they started going to the flatback ones um, and the carved ones as we got into um, you know more and more uh, of the mandolin orchestra stuff. But they couldn't hear the guitars over all the mandolins and mandolas and mandocellos. 
So they wanted a, a more volume and came out with the bigger body ones. Now Martin's first dreadnought, although it was a different than we know it today, because um, it was different bracing and um, body style a little bit, but it was 1916 was really the first Martin dreadnought that came out. So 1909 really predated that by a way. So the 1909 Lakeside Jumbo, and hold the back of that up for him, Daryl. You can see it looks like really nice Brazilian rosewood. You, some of you guys have seen this before, but it's actually, they had artisans who painted wood grain on things. It's p painted wood grain on a birch, birch sides and back. It looks like the nicest Brazilian you've ever seen, but um, didn't come out. And that, it's also what we call straight or ladder braced. Well, you can see behind Daryl, there's a picture of a, a Martin top that shows the X bracing that we're more, com more commonly see with dreadnoughts today. And when you would have ladder brace, they were just simply go laterally across there. So different style of bracing and stuff, but really one of the first um, big body steel string guitars, 1909. Also from 1909, Matt's holding a Gibson a Mandola, an H1. Uh, it was, th this one was very early after they changed to the Gibson label. Before 1909, they had, in early 1909, they had Orville's picture and his lira um, on the inside on the label. So this is a pretty early 1909 Mandola. So 1909. Maybe we'll do a Carter family song. <laughs> I played in Butch Baltasari's mandolin orchestra in Nashville for about two months, and uh, he was the most patient man I think I ever met. Just the tuning of all these mandolin instruments was, <laughs> during rehearsals, was he was he was kind of a saintly guy. Really, so. Say that you love me again. 
still. Yeah, that sounds like a cannon to me, so to speak, right? Is it popping like that out there? Wow. Yeah, it sure is. All right. So we started to get more volume then with the bigger bodies. Um, really starting in that turn of the century. Now we're moving up a little bit to the, to the early 30s and mid 20s. Um, since Matt was on the Mandola, we gave him another one. This is a ni uh, March 31, 1924, Lloyd Lohr signed H5 Mandola. It's really, um, John Reichman says the Mandola was just a mandolin that they let get ripe and didn't pick it on time, so it got bigger. <laughs> Slightly different scale um, in tuning and stuff, but it was really a big part of the mandolin orchestra. I think that the F5 lures, about 235 have been found so far out of the maybe 330 that were made, and there's only 24 H5 mandolas made, signed by lure that have popped up so far, so it's pretty rare. Um, Daryl's playing a 1931 OM18. Um, again, back to after the mandolin craze started to die out, people were really into banjos. We don't have any banjos on stage today, so don't worry about that. But the um, but be, they, Martin was encouraged in the late 20s to make what they call an orchestra model, 14 fret on. Used to, it was before that it was mostly 12 frets. They wanted to attract the banjo players that were leaving that now out of favor genre of music and come to guitars more. So they came up with basically their triple O size with a 14 fret neck. Really, the first time they started coming out with those was. Perry Bechtel was a music teacher that was kind of famed to have the very first one, but 29, 30, 31, somewhere right in there. So a 1931 OM18, again, mahogany sides and back, um, long scale, and uh, nice guitar. So 31 and 1924 for the mandolin. I don't think Matt will say this, but he had a hell of a night. Uh, his flight just got in. He got guy. to. What's that? You should see the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> he just got here at 6 a.m. Uh, with an all night flight that was delayed. Lucky to get out of Boston. All night long situation right there. So if I make any mistakes, it's the instrument and the airline's fault. I'm really glad I made it. It's wonderful to be playing these and hanging out. So. Thank you. 
I am a poor wayfaring pilgrim And I'm traveling through this world of woe There is no sickness, no toil, no danger In that bright world to which I go I'm going there to see my mother She said she wouldn't meet me when I come Oh, I'm just going over Jordan I'm just going over gonna hover on me yes I know my pathway is gonna be rough it's gonna be steep but you just feel lie just before me and these weary eyes no more no more no more will we I'm going there to see my father He said he would meet me when I come Oh, I'm just going I'm just going I'm just going I'm just Said he would meet me when I come. I'm just going. I'm just going. I'm just going. I'm just going 
I'm just going. <laughs> no set list. They're just making this as they go. Well, of course. We're going to run out of ideas real quickly here. And sleep deprivation will take over. And caffeine. Yes. Uh, we're going to make you play one more okay, guitar yeah. and we'll be all done. Yeah. Now, um, these are from 1934. These are our twins. One is a triple O twenty eight Rosewood that Daryl has in the triple O eighteen here. When uh, Gibson was making a lot of sunburst finishes on guitars. You can see a lot of these are Gibson up here. And Martin was kind of playing around with a little bit to decide what style they wanted to have. And in 1934, they made 13 or 14 of these darker sunbursts that are commonly called a mudburst. Very few of them made, so these are pretty rare. Um, steel T-frets and T-bars, right? Yeah, for the neck. So they have the T-bar. Um, instead of the earlier ebony like the other, the OM would have had. Um, so really great. We're lucky to have these two here today. And uh, again, a triple O 28 rosewood and a triple O 18 mahogany. 1934. That was the year of my mom and dad's birth. They were Kentucky folks, uh, tobacco farm raised and all that. So I'm going to do a song of my dad's for 1934. He would have never owned one of these because uh, uh, tobacco farmer kids don't have such things. Uh, as a matter of fact, he got a Gibson somewhere later, later, like 18 or 20 years old or something. And it was a cheaper Gibson. Uh, and he always wanted a hummingbird. So he got a spray can and put a hummingbird on his uh, Gibson. He really did. And um, which, of course, ruined it. And on top of that, in northern Indiana, in the garage, he, with no heat, he hung it out there for the winter. Uh, yeah, that's what exactly happened. And. Uh, but I'll do uh, a song that I wrote about my dad. I was going to do one of his songs, but I, I, now that I told the story about the Gibson thing, I think I'll have to do this. So the other thing, this is the very first thing I ever learned on the guitar, uh, what I'm, this intro. So here it is. <laughs> Farm boy from Kentucky Hills Learned to play guitar for his back porch thrills Lean a ladder back chair on a windowsill And look out at the stars He must have got it up in Michigan He and his brothers were speaking then when he took it to Gary, he brought it with him, that Gibson Hummingbird guitar. And oh, how that guitar would ring. Dad would close his eyes and say, Silverhead Daddy would always bring a tear to his eye. I was all of five years old With my brother Don and a kid down the road We just did what we was told To get outside and play Someone wrapped it in a coat And we took it to the swamp Just to see if it'd float but a hummingbird is not a boat And it sank straight away When 
he got home, that's when he heard what we'd done to that hummingbird. And he looked at me, never said a word, just went out back to sea. And there it was in all its mess with the cattails and the red wing nests. There he laid it down to rest For all eternity Joe, Joe, do you want to come up for a minute? You can just, you want to come around or just come up? So now we have um, really two of the best sounding instruments on stage today. It's hard to kind of pick up a few favorites, but these are it. So this is our sweet spot. 1935 D28, thanks to Perry for bringing that. It's really one of the best herringbone guitars around um, early years, still T-bar. It's a great one. Uh, this is a F5, July 9, 1923 F5 lore mandolin that belonged to Phil Williams, and we'll have Joe talk, talk about that right now. Well, thanks, Mark, and thanks to the folks at Fretboard Journal and Wintergrass for making this great event happen. And uh, I'm Joe Vinico from archtop.com. We're pleased to bring three instruments here today, that OM-18 that uh, was played so beautifully here just a moment ago. And we have two mandolins, really from the beginning and kind of the end of the classic period, uh, this 23 uh, Lloyd Lore that was signed on the same day as Bill Monroe's own mandolin. And then here we have a 1941 that was built in the very last batch before World War II. Um, this uh, instrument was, is probably the most famous but least seen mandolin in the Pacific Northwest. Phil acquired it in the early 60s on a tip from a rep from L.D. Heater, who was the um, music rep for the Northwest. They sold accessories and stuff, and he was doing his rounds out in Orofino, Idaho, and uh, called Phil up. He said, a lady has come in here with a mandolin, belonged to her husband. Vivian thought he might have been a barber, which is an unusual. Barbers often had instruments hanging around their shops. And um, the music store proprietor said, we can't do anything with it. Nobody wants one of these things. So um, do you know anybody who might like it? And he said, well, you know, I got this guy in Seattle who's trying to get a whole collection of these things and called Phil up. And after some deliberation, Phil and Vivian decided, we can probably pungle up the 350 bucks and buy the... Uh, <laughs> by the mandolin, and so Phil had it, and he, he really wasn't alerted in, into quite what it was until Mike Seeger dropped by a couple of years ago and, and flipped out when he saw it. And then after that, Phil went to his workshop and he basically built a copy of it from scratch without any plans, just using this as a, as a template, uh, and made a very nice mandolin for himself, which is what he played, and so this one stayed at the house, because I don't think his insurance was enough to cover it. Um, anyway, um, long story short, uh, Phil passed away a few years ago, and unfortunately Vivian, world champion fiddler, just passed here uh, a few weeks ago. 
And uh, her wish was to have the instrument remain uh, in playing uh, rather than being locked up, you know, in a case somewhere. So um, we've been talking with the folks here at Wintergrass about the possibility, since it really is a Stradivarius of the mandolin world, to have a loan program with it the way that uh, Stradivarius and Amadi and Guarneri violins are loaned to promising young players, um, perhaps as part of a competition to be held here at Wintergrass. And uh, this is where you might be able to help make it happen, uh, because Wintergrass is going to be starting, hopefully, a, a crowdfunding um, operation to uh, hopefully acquire the instrument from the estate. And if you're interested in possibly making a contribution, please contact a Wendy at Wintergrass. She's their development director. And you can get in touch with her through the website. Um, anyway, Phil and Vivian were neighbors and good friends. And uh, it's been an honor and a privilege to um, have this mandolin uh, and uh, to uh, hopefully put together a project that will keep it playing for many years to come. So knock yourself out. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. We really owe a lot to Phil and Vivian Williams, who um, we really probably wouldn't be here today without their foresight to gather the music and collect it and record it and help carry it forward. So we really, really owe a lot to them and appreciate the F5 being here today. How young do you have to be to uh, do uh, Since, let's do a Bill Monroe tune then. Or a song or something. Uh. We could try the uh, bluegrass, bluegrass uh, part one. We could do, uh, it's in just blues and G. Okay. Maybe we'll try the bluegrass part one here. Bill Monroe.
that's an, that's an amazing instrument. Yeah. Thanks for letting me play it. Okay, now, you know, for mandolins, really the, the best mandolins for at least this genre of music are mostly the F5s. Um, and so we're getting out of chronological order because they really, Lloyd Lohr signed his last instrument in December of 1924, and they still had some after that. But the, uh, the mandolin craze kind of started dying off. So it wasn't wasn't really till Bill Monroe came up with his July 9, 23 in a barber shop in 1946 or seven when he started introducing the mandolin to this genre of music. So really for um, the sweet spot, really for Martin's 35, 36, 37, for the D18s and D28s, and for the mandolins, all the lower ones are 23, well there's a few 22s I think, um, 1924. But after Lloyd left, they still had the same people there working on them and making mandolins, and they, even though the craze kind of died off, uh, some pretty good ones came out of that. So they're commonly called the fern after Lloyd Lohr um, left. This is a 1929 fern that Matt has now that Greg Boyd has loaned it to us. He's up there and has it in his shop. And then Daryl has a uh, 1936 D18 that's really one of the best ones around that you'll see at the festival here. So 1929 Gibson F5, so-called fern, is the fern inlay in the peg head is why they call it that. And then a mahogany sides and back, steel T-bar, T-frets, 1936 D18. <laughs> There's a dark and a troubled side of life There's a bright and a sunny side too Though we meet with the darkness and strife The sunny side we also may view Keep on the sunny side, always on the sunny side Keep on the sunny side of life It will help us every day It will brighten all our ways If we keep on the sunny side of life If we keep on the sunny side, always on the sunny side, keep on the sunny side of life. Okay, that's a good place to be.
Dante. Um, by the way, we're not going to get to all these instruments today. You guys sit here that long. For the first time, Wintergrass is doing a musical instrument museum for all these vintage guitars and mandolins. It's over in the Weston in the Lake Quinault room from 4 to 6 today and 4 to 6 tomorrow. So if you guys want to uh, come over there and talk about these, look at them a little up, a little closer, most of these instruments will be over there to look at. You guys are welcome to come too after you get some sleep. <laughs> Um, these are um, 1937 D18. It's been on the stage many times. Chuck Egner's guitar. It's a great, one of the best sounding D18s around. Have to have it every year. It's a great sounding guitar. Mahogany sides and back. T bar neck again. Uh, Matt's holding a 1937 Gibson F7. When, when, the, when the mandolin craze died off in the mid-twenties, Gibson had a bunch of uh, mandolin bodies left over in the attic. Um, they also had, there's an F4 here. The F4 was the top of the line model before they came out with the F5 and Lloyd Lore designed this based on violins and stuff. So the Lore ones are really the Stradivarius of, of mandolins. He spent a lot of time in engineering working on that. But they had all these extra things in the attic, and Gibson was, if nothing, thrifty and wanted to do something with all those. So they said, well, we got all these F4 necks, which are shorter than the F5, and we got all these F5 bodies. Let's put those together and call them something else. Oh, yeah, let's call it an F7. So that's what they did. They made a bunch of these F7s, some F10s and 12s, which are similar. Uh, but they had the it's the same long scale, but you'll notice most of, in most of the lowers, the bridge is placed right where these peaks are. And it's lower set now because they kept the same scale so you could play it the same. So um, of what a lot of folks have done, like this one that Matt has, is they put an F5 neck in it. Randy Wood did this one years ago. So it's really what many people call a poor man's lore. It has, uh, he took the back off to put the new neck on to make it into a true F5 um, and then redid the bracing in the top a little bit. So Because by, you know, by 37 when this came out, most of the guys that were in the 20s working on Lloyd's term were gone, retired. So they had people that didn't know quite as much what to do. They hadn't had Lloyd's instruction in those days. So this was an original F7. We might get to this later. We're kind of running out of time for all of them. And then that's what they should sound like. If you play the two, Bill Monroe's first recordings with his brother Charlie was with an F7. He had this until he found his F5 in the barbershop in 1946. So if you the early Monroe recordings, you can tell it's a little higher pitch that doesn't sound quite as deep and throaty as we're used to with the, the lores. So 1937 from the Gibson factory and F7 and on D18 from 1937. Crooked road to get where I am going To get where I am going I must walk a crooked road And only when I'm looking back I see the straight and narrow I see the straight and narrow When I walk a crooked road I sing a lonesome song To anyone who listens to anyone who listen, I will sing my lonesome song. And when I hear you singing to the sorrow sound so hopeful, the sorrow sound so hopeful when I sing my lonesome song. And a lonesome song will be my true companion when all else has abandoned for singing of their own. And a lonesome song will fill my days with gladness Make joy out of sadness When I show this lonesome song to you
long to be a happy man And there's a life that I am given And there's a life that I am given I long to be a happy man And when the noise turns to stillness I see I have the making I see I have the makings to be one happy man And a happy man will be my true companion When all else has abandoned the happy of their own And a happy man will fill my days with gladness Make joy out of sadness When I show this happy man to you Crooked road to get where I am going. To get where I am going, I must walk the crooked road. And only when I'm looking back, I see the straight and narrow. I see the straight and narrow when I walk a crooked road. Problem is, each one you don't want to stop playing it. So yeah. Well, we're that going kind of long here. Depends on how. Apparently, they need to get the drums out here at some point, so we might have some action in the back of the stage. Um, this is the the one that Joe Vinical brought. That's a 1941 F5. It was toward the end before the war. Gibson wasn't making too many of them at all. I don't, you know, very small numbers came out. But it's the same basic um, design as the other F5s. Um, Gibson was making big body guitars really in the in early 30s, 33, 34, the jumbo came out. Um, and Hawaiian music was still pretty big in those days and one of the well-known performers, they called him the Wizard of the Strings, was a guy named Roy Smeck, lived in New York. Great, very talented. In fact, the very first motion picture with a soundtrack, still on YouTube, was Roy playing his ukuleles and his guitars. Great player. Um, and he was one of the first endorsers of Gibson guitars. He and Nick Lucas were really the first two guys that lend their name to Gibson to come out with um, an artist-endorsed model. Um, Daryl has a 1934, is that right, Jim, 34? That's what I heard. I think, yeah, 34. Um, they made two models of the Roy Smeck. One was called the Stage Deluxe, and we see those quite a bit with mahogany sides and back. And the other one was called the Radio Grande. Here's the Radio Grande here, too. That one's from 36. Now, the, the Radio Grandes were either natural finished or this big sunburst like this most of the time. But it, Gibson being Gibson, nothing was really set in stone. So sometimes they grabbed the wrong neck out of the box and put it on. So this one he has is from 34. It's marked as a stage deluxe, but it's rosewood sides and back, which would make it a Radio Grande. Um, they also had those inlays on the fretboard that are generally known as Nick Lucas. Um, came on the Nick Lucas guitar as well. So it's really um, a combination of the two, but a great sounding one. If you guys have been here every year, you've seen the 36 Radio Grande played. They came with, um, with no frets. They were meant for Hawaiian style play, lap style play. No frets, but otherwise a round neck and kind of ready to go. And as Hawaiian music, really in the 30s, if you were, took guitar lessons, you were just as likely to learn Hawaiian style, lap style, as you were Spanish round neck style. But it kind of grew out of favor over the years. And so many of them have been converted by putting frets in and resetting the neck and the bridge a little bit and making it into a Spanish style guitar that we play today. So again, uh, 1934 Gibson. Um, Radio Grande slash Stage Deluxe, Roy Smeck, and a 1941 F5 Gibson mandolin. Well, 
I mentioned a while ago my dad's uh, and mom's birth year was 34. And I got into another story about uh, taking that guitar to the swamp. Uh, but now I'm going to do an actual song on my dad's right here. this world turn around Hey, when you hit rock bottom you still may not be on the ground Hey, I can tell you something in case you're walking with a cane mm, It ain't love, it ain't money, it's the whiskey that eases the pain Eve told Adam that she had apples for sale And old Adam bought the first one and I bought the last one and went to hell Hell, I can tell you something in case you're walking with your cane It ain't love, it ain't money, it's the whiskey that eases the pain Chase my troubles away And while you're waking up tomorrow I'll still be living right here today Hey, if you need a crutch Don't you try to walk with no cocaine It ain't love, it ain't money It's the whiskey that eases the pain around. 
around and around Hey, if you hit rock bottom You still may not be holding the ground Hey, I can tell you something In case you're walking and squawking And talking and gawking and mocking Oh, it ain't love, it ain't money It's a whiskey that eases a pain the pain It ain't love, it ain't money It's the whiskey that eases the pain Hey It's another mandolin. <laughs> this is kind of making me want to cry. Just... <laughs> so um, we're going to try the uh, the stock F7 with a shorter F4 neck on it and see um, what Matt can do with that thing. So we described that one already. Um, we've had a lot of Martins and Gibsons, which of course are the two big manufacturers, but there was really a lot of... Um, really good guitars made in the Chicago area, mostly made by the Regal Musical Instrument Company in Chicago, sold as Washburns, as Regals, um, and various other brands. And some pretty good guitars came out of there that were equal in quality uh, to the Martins and the Gibsons. One of the companies that sold an awful lot of really high-end fancy banjos was called the Bacon and Day Company, based in Groton, Connecticut. Their factory burned down, I think, in 1939, and with the Depression, they didn't really open again. But as the banjo craze wore off, they started making some guitars, and, mo and many of them, if not all of them, were made by um, Regal, but branded as Bacon and Day. So Daryl's holding a 1935. These are both from 1935. Um, Bacon and Day Me Plus Ultra Troubadour, archtop guitar. Um, they, you can see on the headstock there, I mean, we, there's another one back here we'll describe in a little bit, but that was the common Bacon and Day headstock um, with the rhinestones inlaid and what, that they did that a lot with their banjos, they were very fancy. So, um, and it's a really deep bodied arch top, still Gibson was kind of ruling the day with their L5, Mother Maybell had one of those I think that was 29, and there's lower signed L5 guitars because that was part of the master model line, the F5 mandolin, the H5 mandola, and the L5 guitar were really part of the master model line that Gibson did. But let's see what an archtop guitar sounds like. I'm sure it'll sound great with Daryl. And then the, uh, see if you can, you'll hear the difference, I think, with the less deep throaty sound of the stock F7 with the original short neck. <laughs>
Um, before the F5 came out from Gibson, they, their top of the line model was an F4. This one is a blackface F4 from 1911, as I recall. Um, it's the early one that they called a three point. It has an extra point up there on the F hole. And we'll see if we can't get that guy tuned up and trying it. Um, the one that Daryl has is a 1938 Washburn top of the line, which was called the Solo Deluxe, made by Regal. Gibson actually made a few of those. For some reason, the wholesale distributor for the Washburn line, which was their top of the line guitar that they offered, this green book here was their catalog from 1937. It was called Tonk Brothers. They were in Chicago. And they were wholesale distributors, so they asked other companies and factories to make units for them. Then Regal made this one, and Gibson made a few. For some reason, they got sideways with Regal and went up to Kalamazoo and had Gibson make. So there's a few Gibsons exactly like that as well. This one's a Regal made. It's 14 fret, rosewood sides and back. Um, and they had the fancy inlays and gold tuners and that kind of stuff that made it their kind of top of the line. Uh, model. So we're going to try a 1911 F4. This was, again, the top of the line before the F5 came out, pre-Lloyd Lohr. Uh, carved top and back and really was kind of the design that Orville himself, before he left the company early on at the turn of the century, um, came out with. So mixing up years a bit, but 1938 and 1911. about me when I'm gone Though our friendship ceases from now on If you can't say anything real nice It's better not to talk at all That's my advice Oh, you go your way I'll go mine It's best if we do But here's a kiss I hope that this brings lots and lots of luck to you And I don't know how I'll carry on Talk about me when I'm about me when I'm gone, though our friendship ceases from now on, if you 
can't say anything real nice It's better not to talk at all, that's my advice Oh, you go your way, I'll go mine, it's best that we do But here's a kiss, I hope that this brings Lots of love to you, girl. don't know how I'll carry on Oh, please don't talk about me when I'm don't talk about me when I'm Please don't talk about me when I'm gone Similar to an orchestra model, um, Wash or the Washburn is similar to an orchestra model, okay. Uh, Martin. Okay, this is our um, final set. We have to wrap up here. Thanks again for coming, and thanks to Wintergrass for letting us do this every year, and the Fretboard Journal for helping put it on. Um, when you don't forget we have the musical instrument museum going on where most of these that we didn't get to will be there you come over to the Weston from four to six today and tomorrow to check us out and talk with them if you want we'll be here for a little while afterwards as well if you want to take a look at these and talk some more um, thank to the, thanks to uh, Matt and Daryl for getting up early and struggling through the travels to come here thanks this is a absolute pleasure thank you we really appreciate them um, so for the final one set here, we're going with um, Phil Williams' Lloyd Laura 5 again, since it's one of our best ones here. Got to hear that again. Um, Martin started to change some of their configuration in guitars in the late 40s. When the war came around, they lost some of the ability to use metal parts, changed the, the neck uh, reinforcement rod and those kind of things. And after the war, they started getting back to the normal configuration again. But um, they had a lifetime warranty. If you bought a guitar and something broke on it, they'd fix it for as long as the original owner owned it. And they started having troubles with the tops coming up. People were using too heavy a strings, and it was a problem for them. So they started going away from the scalloped bracing, which if you see the top here, From an early 60s Martin 12 string, you have it. There's a two by four in there for the bridge plate for a, because <laughs> it was a 12 string. But this is the X brace, and you can see, you can look at it closer later, but there's no, the, the scallop bracing that came out in the 30s and was really kind of through the golden era through 44, they, they put a swoop in these and it made the braces lighter so the top vibrated better and they sounded better. Um, they sounded different. I shouldn't say they sounded better. So in, in 45 and 46, they started going to the more straight brace, although tapered. And it's a different sound, a great sound. 45 and 46 Martins are very unique for that tapered brace note. Um, Daryl has a 46 D28. So it's still a herringbone in 46. They ran out of the herringbone because it was made in Germany. And after the war, there wasn't a lot of industry that was left in Germany after the war. So they ran out of the herringbone and started going to a different trim. The herringbone is the, the trim pattern around the edge of the guitar. So this was one of the last herringbones, tapered braced, not scalloped, um, and really great sounding guitars. Dan Tominski was here last night on stage. If you guys saw him, he has a 46. Didn't bring it with him. I think he had a Gallagher on stage last night. It's hard to travel with these things. But uh, if you see Dan's beautiful guitar that he plays, it's a 46, the same thing. So we're going back to Phil Williams' Lore F5 um, and a 46 herringbone. By the way, when you exit here, that curtain will be open on the end. Our builder showcase is right here behind us, and you can access it through there. It's just around the corner. Please go by and check out some of the folks that came here to show their guitars and mandolins and fiddles that they're playing um, and support them. They, we couldn't do Wintergrass without all those folks coming down, so go say hi to them on the way out. And feel free to come up and talk if you want afterwards. And thanks again for coming, everybody. Thanks to Matt and Daryl for showing up.
Well, the legend lives on from the Chippewa down From the big lake to call Gitchikui The lake you just said never gives up her dead When the skies in November turn gloomy With a load of iron ores, 26,000 tons More than the Edmund Fitzgerald weighed empty That good shipping crew was aboard to be chewed When the gales of November came early the ship was the pride of the American side Coming back from some mill in Wisconsin As the big freighters go, it was bigger than most With a crew and good captain, we'll season Concluding some terms with a couple of steel firms They left fully loaded for Cleveland And later that night when the ship's bell rang Could it be the north wind they'd been feeling? Supper time came, the old cook came on deck saying, fellas, it's too rough to feed ya. At 7 p.m., a main hatchway caved in. He said, fellas, it's been good to know ya. The captain wired in, he had water coming in, and the good shipping crew was in peril. And later that night, when its lights went out of sight, came the wreck from the Edmund Fitzgerald. goes when the waves turn the minutes to hours the searchers all say they didn't make whitefish bay if they put 15 more miles behind her they might have split up they might have capsized they may have broke deep into the water now all that remains is the faces and the names of the wives sons and daughters The old hall in Detroit they prayed In the Maritime Sailors Cathedral The church bell chimed Till it rang twenty-nine times For each man on the Edmund Fitzgerald Now the legend lives on From the Chippewa on down Through the big lake they call Kichigumi the lake it is said never gives up her dead When the skies of November turn gloomy
Thanks, guys. A couple of, couple of closing things. Uh, you know, Wintergrass is a nonprofit organization, Acoustic Sound. I'm Mark Demery, by the way. I never announced myself. I'm on the board, and we put this thing together every year. When you walk around the halls here, there's uh, people with uh, tags that are volunteers. We couldn't do this event without volunteers. So if you feel like volunteering once in a while, please do, and thank them in the hallways as you see them. Uh, one of the people that I didn't mention, John West, before. John West is, is John here today? Um, he was a, one of the original board members of Acoustic Sound Wintergrass and supplied a number of instruments today. We went down last week to pick up his uh, December 1st, 1924 Lloyd Lower, and it had been stolen from his storage locker. So we've turned in some police reports and stuff. But if any of you guys see an F5 floating around with a label scratched off, please call me and we'll. Uh, try and get it back to John one of these days if we can. Um, and we also have a patron table up by the ticket place. Stop by there and say hi. Uh, there's some posters for sale up there. There's some raffle things going on and talk to our folks that um, think about donating to the festival as well. And once again, Matt Flinner, Daryl Scott, thank you guys so much for coming out and playing. And to the Fretboard Journal for helping us put it on.